for the scrutiny performance panel service improvement of finance. First item on the agenda is apologies for absence. No, none. Second item, disclosure of personal and prejudicial interest. Anyone? No. Next item is the prohibition of whip votes and declarations of party whips. No. OK. Item four is the minutes of the previous meeting. Any comments or queries? No. OK, thank you. Right, that rapidly moves us on to public questions, and I don't think we've had any, have we? No. OK, uh, quarter one budget monitoring uh, report. Uh, can I ask uh, Mr Ben Smith to give us an update on that report? Thank you, Chair. Good morning. I'm just cranking up the difference engine to uh... <laughs> run you through relatively quickly. I'll be very brief in terms of technical officer advice, given you will have all probably seen the advice I gave to Cabinet uh, last week and various bits of reporting. So there were four recommendations which Cabinet endorsed. The important one for me is number three, which was around giving um, instruction to all directors to look to minimise spend given the um, ongoing in-year difficulties that are likely to get more challenging as we go through the year. Section 2.2 reminds that there is a continuing shortfall in collection fund of at least £2 million and I expect that to continue in the current year with no assurance of, of any ongoing support from Welsh Government unlike in previous years. Section 2.3 sets out the first quarter position by directorate. Crucially, this is before the pay award and other matters that I'm going to refer to. So you have two directorates overspent, two underspent and one break even. To be fair to corporate services, theirs is driven predominantly by COVID claims and costs, and we would expect that to improve once we get money back from Welsh Government. Um, the issue fundamentally is when we come on to the pay award, I suspect that every single one of those will be overspent rather than underspent. And it is to do with shortfalls in base funding for the ongoing pay awards for the current year, which are only likely to get worse, which is the reason for the strong advice I gave last week and will continue to give. Um, in terms of section 2.7, it summarises where we are with the very early claims into Welsh Government and success rate to date. That remains uh, perfectly reasonable and gives me assurance that the corporate services overspend due to COVID related matters will be rectified. Crucially, section 2.8 emphasises that the budget was set on an assumption of a 3% pay award, very much in line with many other authorities, if not all authorities in England and Wales. Some were a little bit higher, some were lower. Um, there is an ongoing pay award still being balloted by uh, unions to their members on, which would be a flat rate £1,925 per spinal point for this year. And there are likely to be uh, similar pressures on, on next year. Uh, my estimate is that the excess cost across teachers, because a 5% pay award, 5 to 8% pay award, depending on whether you're a newly qualified teacher, and that flat rate offer for local government staff indicates that the costs would exceed the budgeted sum by around £12 million. Uh, energy costs are real and prescient for us all in our own lives as well as councils and those energy costs are being closely monitored. We are protected in the very short term by our advanced buying. Uh, that advanced buying means that we have bought our energy for less than the value of the cap. The problem comes in due course if the cap isn't continued and we are faced with very substantial wholesale costs going forward. Section 2.9, the bit in bold is important. I have reminded all responsible officers they may not overspend, otherwise they would not be in compliance with financial procedure rules, which are part of the Constitution. Uh, section 2.10 emphasises that I did have some spare pots held centrally, like I always do. The issue is, as we move on to the contingency fund, they are all committed at first quarter monitoring report stage already. Section 3.2, the table for the contingency fund emphasises that point. All available sums to me in the year have been taken, plus balance sheet contingency to potentially offset that uh, potential pay award pending, which means we start at first quarter with nothing left forecast on the contingency fund. That is most unusual for us at this stage in the year. Um, and that is the reason why I emphasise towards the end of 3.2 in bold. All of these are one off actions which help sort out 22, 23, but they merely defer all of the problems into 23, 24. 
So section 3.3 concludes that it is inevitable that there will be additional draws from reserves. Section four pulls it all together and emphasises that taking everything into the round with all the one off actions, I expect the council to be forecast overspent to the tune of three million pounds based on the first quarter results. It is, of course, a very fluid position given things are changing by the minute, hour and day at a national level. And some of these will ultimately have real world consequences for, for us as a council, like all councils. The table on the following page emphasises that the net overspend forecast is still three million pounds to be addressed. And at the moment, I have to balance the budget by drawing that additionally from reserves. Section five in normal format sets out the capital budget spend to the first quarter. And as ever, spend is relatively low. And I always rub my hands in glee because it means I will save on the capital financing costs in the short term. Uh, section six, normally I skirt straight over the housing revenue account. But as was referenced in cabinet, there are real pressures on the housing revenue account as well this year. And those are likely to grow. And then finally, I draw your attention to Appendix A and emphasise that uh, the table says what the words say, which is directorates are already a million pounds overspent at the first subtotal. It then shows me taking out about 12 million pounds worth of um, one offs. It includes the estimated effect of the pay offer at 12 million pounds, still all subject to be uh, advised. And then in earmarked reserve shows a further draw of the three million to balance off the overspend forecast. Um, and I will repeat the advice I gave to Cabinet, which is the budget and uh, forecast out term position is currently expecting £26 million to be drawn from reserves. Council on Thursday will have my update on overall reserves. And I would assure and remind that reserves for this authority are very, very substantial. But I repeat, drawing £26 million from reserves in this year when the outlook is challenging to say the least is 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 not going to be sustainable it is broadly in line with what was set as the budget with a clear intention to release money from amongst others the economic recovery fund but that is the reason for some of my concerns that i have expressed uh, to cabinet and and others have expressed some at officer level some at a political level and clearly all the way through individual authorities through the wlga the welsh government's pronouncements and the various pronouncements and assumptions that leading economic commentators, political commentators uh, and, and the government's uh, intentions and plans over the coming months, which mean um, yet again for the third year in a row, albeit less so for COVID, I'm saying it's an unusual year and my uncertainties vastly outweigh my certainties. And uh, therefore I um, uh, am concerned about the current year but we will balance. I am extremely concerned about future years. That should not come as a surprise. And I'm sure you'll get exactly the same message in every council up and down the land. But just in case any members of the media do end up watching this in terms of from the evening post, I did need to make that clear. Um, everyone is going to be in the same boat to a varying degree of nuance and inference on it. But that is the only logical conclusion I can draw at this stage. I, like everyone else, will be glued to the, the machinations at a national level to see what does or doesn't come to pass, because many of the things that have already happened have had direct real world consequences for this authority and others. And that's part of the reason for some of the decisions that were taken last week at Cabinet, where we are looking to see what happens as the relative froth calms down a bit. I think I need to say no more than that, Chair. I'm sure there will be questions. Some of them I may you will probably understand which to avoid answering because they may have a, a heavier political context than normal. I will try and well, I will stick to what my uh, obligation is, which is to give the officer advice as best I can. But it is in an utterly uncertain environment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Uh, any questions? Leader, thank you for coming. Um, would, would you like to say anything? Yes, please, Chair, if that's OK. Apologies for being slightly delayed. I, I did intend to get you for the start. Um, thank uh, first uh, Mr Smith for his advice, which I uh, fully agree with. Um, uh, again, it's it's a very odd and volatile position that we find ourselves in at the moment. But as Mr Smith said, it isn't uh, unique to Swansea. This is now uh, not just a national issue, a national crisis. And um, as I said at Cabinet uh, last week, um, some of the decision making in London at the present time is beyond belief. It has had a direct impact uh, on this authority. Uh, Mr Smith uh, no doubt will have uh, alluded to the fact that uh, people will have seen the borrowing rates uh, that were available to uh, councils through the public uh, loans board etc uh, going up significantly. They have since come down again but that volatility is not helpful. 
Um, and uh, again, commend Mr. Smith for his decisions to borrow early whilst we were in a very, very handsome uh, position of being able to borrow at less than 2%. Uh, obviously, the borrowing rates are still significantly higher than that, even though they've come back down. Um, the the point that Mr Smith made is one that should not be lost. The help that is available currently from UK government does nothing for this authority because we are already well below the cap, but we are pursuing with the Welsh government for that help to be extended past the current date um, because when the deal ends that many Welsh councils will be on, um, obviously the energy costs will then increase significantly as they have for all, lots of homeowners across the UK where their energy deal has finished and then they've been put on to much higher tariffs uh, at a much higher cost. So uh, again, grateful that the UK government have put some help out there, but it means nothing at this point in time and it needs to be extended. We need that confidence into next year um, because otherwise you were looking, uh, we are looking uh, at energy uh, costs, uh, anything between five and 15 million pounds, um, which are, are obviously unfunded at the present time. Um, in addition, pay award, we do not negotiate pay uh, locally, as, as members will know. Um, and again, we would be looking for governments to fully fund the pay awards uh, that are agreed. Um, with inflation out of control at the present time, clearly families are struggling uh, across not just Swansea but across the UK. We support people getting proper pay awards so that their salaries are not eroded but those those pay awards need to be fully funded by the governments. It is no point the governments are agreeing a pay award and then leaving no money to actually pay that out uh, to the workers who deserve it. So um, again those are significant pressures that are currently unfunded. Uh, we are working politically to put pressure on. I would welcome uh, all members of the council, including the scrutiny committee, assisting us in that in terms of keeping the pressure on the governments to fund both the energy costs and uh, the uh, pay, pay award costs um, so that we don't find ourselves in a significant difficult position. I have to say the mood music this morning uh, but was, was very depressing. Um, appears that we're not in for another period of austerity or for public service cuts. It's uh, what they're now terming fiscal responsibility, um, which, you know, for anybody who's been in politics a long time means the government are now considering another round of austerity and another round of cuts. It is not a, a good place to be. And I do hope um, that the government change tack on this. Uh, I don't uh, criticise them for changing uh, bad decisions. Um, I just wish they didn't make bad decisions in the first place. Um, but I do hope they do uh, change tack and that they fully fund the pay awards and that they continue to provide uh, money uh, to help uh, energy costs uh, past the 1st of March. So thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to say that. Thank you, Leader. Um, questions, uh, Councillor Jeff Jones? Yeah, the leaders actually asked, answered part of my <laughs> question anyway with regards to the, you know, the pay awards. Um, um, I, I think there's a figure of 18 million. I was specifically going to ask about schools, you know, uh, would they in the if it didn't actually come from the government? And I assume it's actually coming from the national government and not the Welsh government, the, uh, the, the you know, the funding, the pay award and so on. Um, schools won't be left really in a position where they would have to actually fund the you know the pay award themselves so i um i, I welcome what the leaders actually said there um if i can just jump into um mr smith he actually said about we're actually going to use i think it was 26 million of reserves this year um i know you actually said as well that uh, i think the subject is actually coming up in council on thursday um what percentage of the reserves are we actually talking about there with 26 million? You said it actually can't go on. You know, what is the total figure of reserves that we actually have at hand? So if I come in, um, I haven't got the council papers in front of me, but my understanding and recollection is that we have about £160 million of 
usable reserves, um, some of them more usable than others because some of them are only usable in utter extremists. So £26 million is a very big number. It is a big number, but it's a big number predominantly driven by some of the decisions taken by Cabinet and Council on my advice to establish a rather large economic recovery fund and some of the other reserves. So it is a big number. And clearly that level of burn is not sustainable, but it has to be viewed in the context of the overall level of reserves. My advice on Thursday, it's it set out in the report, is, is again going to be saying it's relatively modest changes to individual reserves at the strategic level. And the decision uh, will be one for council when it comes to the following March. <clears throat> in terms of the pay awards, um, yeah, the, the, the teachers pay award is a delegated matter to the Welsh government by way of clarification. Um, it's it, There is a separate teachers review body, but the point the leader has made is one that if money doesn't flow through, um, whether anyone has the ability to fund it is more is more the issue and it remains uncertain, but but clearly a pay award has been uh, indicated at 5% for teachers for this year and 5% for next year with up to 8.9% for newly qualified teachers and there clearly wasn't enough money in the system. I will not um, make any judgment or comment on who, who should be providing for it, but at this point in time the council does not have the money funded and is therefore not in a position to be able to fund it, but I would echo the leader's comments and, and the ones that you've just in, endorsed, Councillor Jones, that um, if the money doesn't come there are what is euphemistically often referred to as tough choices ahead. And sorry, another question I wanted to ask as well. You actually mentioned about the you know the council tax. So there's a two million, um, uh, shall we say, uncollected sum at the present time. Um, how confident are you that we're actually going to get that money? Because it's been funded by the Welsh government in the past. Any shortfall? Have we had any confirmation from the Welsh government that they are going to fund that shortfall now? My, my advice would be at the moment it is the exact opposite. I believe the Welsh Government is not yet in a position to give any comfort of covering any of the, 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 the shortfall. I mean, that position may change depending on decisions made by others in due course. But at this point in time, I have no evidence that there's going to be un, any underpin. We have had the luxury of two years of, of, of that being underpinned. And that sort of level of deficit is itself not sustainable. Again, there are many things to unpick in that, including potentially, because those of you that sit on audit committee, whilst we focus on accounts receivable, uh, council tax collection is in addition to that. And I've got a very fine line to tread between encouraging everyone to pay and collecting it, because ultimately any that isn't collected uh, is recognised in my advice to council on the collection rate and setting the tax base. And any that isn't paid by collectively all falls on those who do pay. Again, trying to tread very, very carefully because it gets into emotive matters. Given the financial burdens and tensions that the whole of society is facing, there is a growing risk that more people may be in the position that they are unable to pay. And it makes it very hard for me to progress uh, re recovering that position. So that's why you've had my clear advice that at the moment you should assume that I am funding all of that shortfall from the council's reserves that position could change, but at the moment I have no assurance that any money is going to come this year, unlike the previous two years, regrettably. Leader, do you want to come in and answer on this? Yeah, question? yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, look, just, just on the reserves point, uh, I think just, uh, again, important to note, the uh, some of the new reserves that we set up, including things like capital equalisation, etc., those are reserves that were set up for us to draw from at some point and that and they were never intended to be there forever they are time limited reserves and that is the reason why i think we are the second best provisioned uh, council uh, in wales in terms of reserves and uh, i think mr smith is nodding there so i think correct on that um so it's not as if we're drawing from general reserves and i think you know again we'll we'll look at the final position when we come to year end but this is about using the reserves that we'd set up some of which is for specific purposes and some of which is what we intended to do but i absolutely uh, agree with what mr smith said this can only be a one-off uh, action and, uh, and again i would hope um, if we are successful in terms of discussions with both governments that the use of those reserves can be reduced somewhat but we will still be using some reserves i would have thought um, this year anyway because of the way in which they've been set up and and how they were intended to be used outside of that on your second question Look, uh, grateful uh, to both governments for the additional support that was available during COVID, but that has come to an end, uh, largely in terms of what's available. What we're left with now is a cost of living crisis. And, you know, I would 
uh, draw a distinction between those people unwilling to pay, uh, which we should pursue, obviously, uh, in the way that we normally would, and those people unable to pay, as Mr Smith said. And I think the realities are, given the energy cost pressures, given the other pressures on people, the inflationary pressures, it's inevitable that there are going to be more people in the position where they're unable to pay because of their um, cash flow situation, because of their job situation, because of their um, uh, household situation. So again, it's about striking the right balance of supporting people to pay uh, in a way that they can and to recover as much as we can. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, part of the, the issue that we're facing now is that we've got mortgage costs uh, much higher than they were just a week ago or 10 days ago. Uh, over a thousand products removed from the mortgage market. People whose deals are coming to an end facing mortgage deals and, and mortgage rates twice what they were just 10 days ago. And that is inevitably going to leave people with less money and inevitably going to force people into debt positions. Uh, my mind could have all been avoided, but we are unfortunately now in this scenario. So I, I do get what uh, Councillor Jones is saying, but I would just draw that distinction. I mean, given the decisions made nationally, I think the position of people falling into debt is going to be much worse this winter. Thank you, Reader. Councillor Peter Black. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just a couple of specific questions. Um, in terms of the capital programme, what, what's the overall impact on the capital programme of the increase in the cost of, of, um, of materials? I mean, obviously, interest rates will have an impact but we borrowed early but the cost of materials and delays on material must be having an impact on the overall cost of the capital program and the second civic question on page 15 um, the council tax reduction scheme we're looking at an underspend of 1.5 million pounds on the council tax reduction scheme and i always thought that was fairly specifically budgeted or based on past experience so i'm just wondering how that underspend has come about and so um, an increase in people in work and not having to draw down on it or other other factors which is leading to that underspend so again chairs Mr. Morning, Mr. Best, if, best if i come in first um materials costs we've seen increases in in components of 10 20 30 percent for some of the individual capital program schemes uh, the smaller ones costs potentially doubling um so the the councillor black is quite right in terms of the material scale of, of of those cost pressures um whilst we are insulated from it in terms of the amounts i've already borrowed the fundamental problem i have is that um it was never going to be i mean the council's position is we have a borrowing en envelope but it's, it's never the case that you suddenly stop borrowing entirely so um, those spend pressures, if, if schemes aren't scaled back or capital isn't curtailed, will themselves have to ultimately be financed. There are major schemes coming forward. Any, any bid for levelling up monies requires a match funding component of borrowing from the authority. Cabinet last week had a decision to make on the Mumble Seawall and the uh, relatively innovative way that that is funded CRMP-wise through revenue support grant, you know, to, to a four-letter acronym and a three-letter acronym, one after the other. Um, the underlying borrowing costs on all of those are utterly uncertain for me. So um, we're not as we're not wholly insulated from those pressures and costs because we will have to go out and borrow for certain things. Uh, and and as the leader has indicated, I mean, effectively the rates at which I'm borrowing, I'm already facing them having doubled, nearly trebled for a short period of time, and and they do worry me. Counter tax reduction scheme is an is is an interesting one. It is budgeted, and I do tend to. Um, give advice which is to uplift for the increase in council tax rises and then make an allowance for people who haven't claimed it but it's getting the balance right and we do typically underspend by quite a substantial sum each year so the amount quoted is not materially different from previous years we do try to encourage take up but like many benefits if they're not administered directly at source um, technically, this one's a locally administered relief, I think, rather than a benefit. Um, but no amount of trying results in everyone taking it up, which is a which is a which is a disappointment. I mean, again, I I I have mixed feelings on it as a, as an officer charged with giving you advice to make sure you balance. I, I I kind of am pleased it's not claimed, but from a policy objective, and I'm sure members would be horrified that people aren't taking up what they are entitled to. So the the amounts are not that surprising in one sense, and and picking up on the leader's point, giving given uh, 
people's individual circumstances and the tightening financial and economic circumstances we face, there is a risk that demand will grow for that. And it is a, a, a demand led budget. So I will gratefully and nastily as a Section 151 officer take the underspend for the benefit of helping to balance the current year. But I'm sure it sits very uneasily with all members across all parties. Uh, if people aren't taking up what they're entitled to, you, you will know, particularly Councillor Black, in terms of some of the wider national stuff across the whole of the UK, um, a whole raft of benefits if they were taken up would cost all governments an awful lot more money than they've ever cost in the past. But uh, rest assured, it's not that surprising a figure. OK, I, th I think the concern is that non take up leads to non collection and that and that is, is obviously a problem. And just coming back to the capital budgets, I mean, are you t are you saying that in terms of the capital schemes which we've committed, we're looking at 10, 15 percent increase in costs or is it more than that, less than that? It, it, it does vary by scheme and I am indicating that there are individual components of material costs that are up by that amount. Part of the discussion and decisions that council will have to take and make when we get through to next March is the affordability of the overall programme um, and, and, and capital spend may need to be trimmed accordingly. Uh, in, in real terms, recognising those pressures. So I'm not saying there's a global blanket 30% uplift across the piece, but we are seeing very real pressures that indicate in certain areas those sorts of levels of increases. And in some of the smaller schemes, um, the very smaller schemes, costs double what they were. And of course, those risks are increased if if any of the funding streams are ones where the council has to act as lead in the first instance and take all of the spending risk and potentially all of the borrowing risk, which is why I gave the advice I did last week, particularly on the Mumble Seawall one, which is a big capital scheme um, where I am concerned about what happens if there are cost changes uh, and I'm carrying all of the borrowing costs as well. So uh, I hope that helps clarify the position. I can't give a definitive answer on all schemes, but you'll be aware from some of the interest you've shown in individual schemes. You've seen those levels of, of increase in individual schemes, Councillor Black. OK, just uh, if I may, just one more question in terms of um, next year's budget. We, we're just starting to plan next year's budget now, I guess, and will have been for some for some weeks. Um, uh, what are we looking at in terms of um, of Un, un, of having to make savings, that's use the word savings, in terms of next year's budget, especially given the fact that Welsh Government has indicated that they, that they are, in real terms, £4 billion um, worse off for subsequent years because of, of the impact of, of what's happening at the UK level. Are we having to make quite substantial savings to, to just break even next year? And do you have any idea what sort of figure we're looking at? Um, I will revert to the very first bit of advice I give. So the short answer and the bit of answer I'm prepared to say is at the moment, the planning assumptions on all of the national assumptions is that there would be a very substantial figure. I do have planning advice and figures in my mind. It would be inappropriate for me to hypothesize that in a public session uh, outside of giving advice to cabinet and council. But you can reasonably conclude that if nothing changes, it would be a very significant ask. And that is the reason for the, the darkness in my tone of officer advice. But I hope the scrutiny panel will accept that this is predominantly a focus on the current year's um, uh, outlook, rightly with concerns about the following years. But I would not wish to be drawn on an amount whatsoever. I, I don't know if the leader wanted to make any further comments, but this is one of the ones where I will need to tread carefully the line between planning for the worst um, hoping for the best and getting a balance right without um, overly concerning, because as I say, every council in the land must be having exactly the same internal conversation. So I, I hope you will forbear with me declining giving giving a figure, even though I do have a figure in my head. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I totally appreciate that and I understand that. And I think the leader wants to come in as well to make a yeah. comment on that. Yeah, if I, if I could just uh, uh, one quick comment on the capital program, just for the avoidance of doubt. So the capital program isn't thirty percent, uh, you know, now unfunded. Um, that is not what Mr. Smith said. So we have seen, uh, obviously, key key elements, key materials go up by as much as thirty percent, and and that has been a, an impact. You'll know also that for some of our bigger schemes, we've got fixed price deals. So we've tried to protect ourselves in terms of the um, exposure for the council uh, on that. Um, as Mr Smith said, uh, prudent that he borrowed um, so much uh, earlier when the rates were lower, so that's locked in. Uh, and of course, on every scheme where we feel cost pressures are coming through, we will try and value engineer that project uh, to make sure it re remains within uh, budget. So 
we, we are deploying a number of, uh, of measures to do that. But the reality is, uh, if inflation continues at 10%, it's likely to go to 15% next year. You know, just to stand still, you're looking at 10 to 15% uh, as, a, as a measure. Ele different elements and different materials may be higher than that. So again, it's it's the job of the project managers and, and uh, the officers to make sure that they manage that. But at the moment, you know, the, the budget uh, that we've sent, set for the capital programme is the budget that we, we currently think will deliver. So that, that's that's where we are. Um, secondly, uh, to come to the uh, the point then that, that we were just discussing, I think, um, uh, oh, where, do you, where do you begin, really? Um, in terms of Wales as a whole, I think uh, leader of WLJ is already on record as saying it's a potential £500 million pound black hole. So five, a half a billion pounds uh, is looking at councils uh, across uh, Wales. And that is accounting for what we think the energy pressures will be, the wage pressures will be, and inflationary pressures on services. Um, there are a number of drivers of that. Clearly, uh, the decisions at national level over the last few weeks have made that much worse because if you just take energy, because uh, the decisions made in the mini budget crashed the pound, um, you then had the dollar surging. And of course, we buy our, all our energy in dollars, so therefore the price of energy immediately becomes more expensive. Many of the goods that we rely on are bought in dollars, so therefore those become more expensive and therefore they drive the inflationary pressures. So, you know, at the moment, I think best estimate, half a billion pounds across Wales. That's what, you know, we've talked about in the WLGA. Mr Smith, uh, obviously, his uh, and his team are preparing some of the scenarios for Swansea Council. Um, and cabinet will be looking at those over the coming months to see what we are. But, you know, there is such chaos at national level. I'm not confident if we planned for tomorrow, tomorrow would be what we planned for because the, the government is all over the place. What we are doing at the moment, though, with uh, officers, as we always do, is to try and set out a set of actions that we might need to take, depending on how bad the mismanagement of the economy is at national level and what that means for Wales and what that means for Swansea. So, uh, you know, we will continue to plan and obviously we'll share those plans with uh, Council when we come to uh, the latter in the year, when we know what the settlement is for Wales, when we know what the budgetary position is from the Welsh Government. Thank you, Leader. Uh, anyone else? No? I have quite a number of questions, both um, which I know that Mr. Smith will have difficulty in answering, uh, but I'm sure that at some stage we will have answers. I think the first question I will ask is where do the contingency funds come from? I think this is an incredibly important question for not just for councillors, but for the public to understand. There isn't a um, never-ending pot. Uh, how do they? How, how are they developed? Where do they come from? And 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 how we how we then are using them? Will, as you described in the in 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 the in the report, there is in your uh, in the report on page eight. It it starts on page seven, finishes on page eight. It's a contingency fund. Uh, box showing a creation of IT development fund reserve. This was agreed as part of the budget last year and ongoing savings. It says uh, a 2.5 million reduction, if if we could have some understanding about that. I think the next question is a lot more difficult and one which I think we will have to ask and put in a letter to not just the leader, but I think this letter may have to go uh, much further. And that is about the homes to school transport. If you if you go to the page, I will get it in a second. I think it starts on page 17 and carries on. There are a number of headings on home to school transport. Uh, it refers to the medium term financial plan on page 17. Then it goes on to further about the agreement to pay suppliers uh, because the cost of fuel and then uh, an increase. It, this, why is there four par parts to it? And uh, I think an explanation is needed to that. The question that Councillor Black asked about the capital funding in, in some weeks ago, some months ago, we asked the question in a f another scrutiny panel about how the cost of materials would be affecting um, projects. 
and uh, we had a, a, a comment about um, value engineering. Can I remind uh, the leader and Mr Smith and, uh, that value engineering isn't always a good value? Uh, an example of that is in the arena, uh, sorry, in, in the stadium, they valued engineering the removal of under soil heat in. They put the heat in, but didn't connect it up. The end result is it cost us quite a considerable amount of money uh, uh, and it cost the, 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 the stadium a lot of money. So I think when when they do value engineering, which I understand they have to do, um, you know, there needs to be a a problem in on looking how that is value engineering is is going to to look at the the um, the future running of any of the projects that we're in. So I think some of those questions you might be able to answer, Mr. Smith or Leader might want to make comment, but I think some of the others will need a, a written reply. Thank you. Yeah, Chair, if I let, if I perhaps come in on the on the general uh, uh, surrounding the the first few questions, and, and perhaps Mr. Smith can pick up the detail. So uh, you know, how is the contingency fund uh, funded? Well, I just refer uh, members back to the fact that we've had two substantial. Uh, surpluses over the last two years, which has allowed mm -hmm. us to raise the level of reserves and also to continue to replenish uh, the con contingency fund. Um, we set up a specific contingency fund, uh, which Mr Smith probably can give a bit more detail on in terms of how it's been used in previous years, but it's there for uh, assisting with uh, spends that, that, that occur in year that are not in the budget, uh, which can then be placed against the contingency fund. But it's it's generally been possible to continue to replenish that because we've had a, a healthy surplus and obviously the rest of the surplus then has gone into either the capital equalization reserves or bolstering other reserves. So, you know, back to the point that we are the second best provisioned council in Wales and that our, our reserves have gone up significantly during those years where we've been able to realize uh, a surplus. The IT reserve, that was one that we specifically set aside. Uh, again, uh, you'll know that we're going through a transformation program at the moment. It's important that you have a reserve uh, available to, to fund that. There are a number of things that we're also funding, as you'll be aware, in terms of the schools provision for investment in new schools IT, um, which is about £7 million over, over 10 years. Uh, again, but this was, I think, uh, Ms. Mr Smith can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is more to do with the general IT estate that we have. Uh, and again, it's about use of that reserve to assist with the, the costs of delivering the Oracle transformation. Um, home to school transport, well, for the reasons we've been talking about, there are significant pressures on home to school transport at the moment for the providers. Um, energy costs, fuel costs rocketed uh, in the last 12 months, and that has have obviously had an impact in terms of the costs, which is why there is a, a pressure there. Um, and yet get your point chair in terms of value engineering it's not about uh, taking risks with schemes or stepping away from the aims that the project had for delivering that facility it's sometimes about making sensible choices uh, and having negotiations with the developers and with the um, with the uh, construction partners about what you can do to deliver within the budget. But I do take your point. Uh, you know, I, I've very much resisted uh, attempts to change the ethos and the ambition of what we're delivering to make sure we maintain um, the delivery. Because I, I do take your point in things like the stadium. You know, you could take make a short term saving for a, a longer term cost, and and that's uh, not good economics, is it? So. Um, uh, perhaps hand over to Mr. Smith for for his contribution. Before I hand over back to Mr. Smith, what I was on about the home school transport is four different headings. That's the point of getting at. One is about the medium term financial plan, the reduction. One is about paying suppliers to obviously because of the increase in the fuel costs. Uh, then about the valuation of the the school transport. But that's a separate issue, and then a pro rata seven pound. Again, about um, a petrol allowance being offered to others. I think the clarification we need is why there's four separate headings. Um, what's the detail of those four separate headings? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Smith. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, 
I'll probably answer them in reverse order if that's all right. I would have nothing further to add to the conversation and comments that leaders had on the value engineering one on capital. I take your point in terms of four components on home to school transport. There are four discrete items. One of them is very small and with the benefit of hindsight, unless it was particularly pressing to be identified separately, could have got away with three of them. Uh, I think the point you make is a valid one. I've given clear advice that even before the pay award, one directorate was significantly overspent and I've given specific and firm advice to that director. Uh, that is with some um, understanding and some compassion because it, we, we we have over the 13 years I've been here, we've had home to school transport pressures in the past. Um, if it wasn't for the fact I've had to give advice to cabinet, which is to stump up every spare pot of contingency sum I've got to cover off the pending pay award, um, inflationary pressures in that area, home school transport, in the same way that there are other mixed economies in some of the social care provision pressures, etc., uh, would have been prime candidates for consideration for use of the centrally held inflation pot or the centrally held contingency fund. It is perhaps unfortunate for my education colleagues that uh, this one is the one that's blown up first for them at a time when ordinarily there would be pots of money that I could direct um, colleagues and cabinet members to consider utilising in, in the very short run. The pressures are real in terms of some of those price rises and pressures, and I, they won't be the only ones that you will see coming through the year without doubt. The ICT reserve, yes, as the leader has indicated, it is for the general provision of ICT estate, um, but there are items coming forward that are likely to see that need be needing to be used on Oracle developments. And um, before you can spend a reserve, you've got to have created the reserve, haven't you? So that's the reason why it was drawn attention to in the report to Cabinet. Cabinet has authorised it. My review of revenue reserves recognises it when it comes to Council on Thursday. And there will undoubtedly be a further update report back to Cabinet on Oracle and potential uses of the, the, the elements of that ICT reserve. Um, Starting with the first one, so uh, this this is this is an interesting one. I'll try not to get too complicated and bogged down in it. I mean, first, some really positive good news. Council has consistently listened to Section 151 officer advice over the years, including several of my predecessors. We have a strong track record of making sure a sum has been available as a contingency sum. That was the case when Council set the budget in March. That contingency sum is twofold. Um, it is a reserve in its own right and typically has a balance on the balance sheet, which is referenced in the report to Cabinet, which is the four million pounds of contingency that wasn't needed at all last year. Um, but it is also crucially budgeted for as an in-year contribution to reserve. So it's a reserve that in your base budget, you, Council has made decisions to continue to top up. Um, so um, that's extremely prudent. And boy, is it proven to have been necessary because I've already had to use it in first quarter. Um, if you go back several years, the contingency sum was higher. As budgets have come under pressure, there has been a need to reduce the amount that we can hold in central contingency and central inflation. But it is something to be recognised and celebrated that um, all, all councils over the years have listened to the advice and officer advice, which is always keep something else back for um, challenging circumstances on top of what is physically held on the balance sheet in terms of reserves. So that's a, that's a crucial point. So you've got three million pounds odd of base revenue budget being planned to be put into the contingency. Um, and that and that's where it comes from. So in one sense, it's only another reserve, but it is crucially a reserve with an existing commitment based on decades of council decisions. The amounts may have changed, but to maintain some contribution into that reserve to cover eventualities, which would ordinarily be exceptional service pressures or price pressures in particularly the care market, or in this case, in home to school transport. Uh, the unfortunate position I'm in is that I've had to give officer advice, which is to commit it all immediately on even bigger pressures and woes that the council faces. Um, but that 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 gives you a bit more technical advice on, on what it is, and it's something to be um, celebrated. It's just that with the scale of the issues all councils face, um, it's there's there's not enough to cover off all eventualities that I envisaged might have turned up. I think I've, I've had a I've had a particularly bad rainy day and a particularly bad rainy week to put it into a slight bit of light relief. Thank you. Can I can I clarify uh, for the benefit of, of of everyone? 
that the budget contribution is a revenue contribution and these the contingency fund and the equalization fund and, and, and other contingency funds that we've been using for revenue come out of our revenue account as opposed to capital account. And I think that's the important issue because as you know, and you know, councillors may not know, we cannot use capital funding as a revenue underpinner. We have to use it as a, as a, um, as a for capital and then revenue as a separate account. I just want to clarify that position. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, are there any other questions or comments, Leader? No? Nothing for me, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. It is a pretty grim report, to be perfectly honest with you, and it doesn't give us a good uh, feeling for the future and how, but we, as a scrutiny board, we will keep you on your toes, Mr. Smith, and make sure you keep on telling us with the leader what's actually happening to our, our finances. And thank you very much for your contribution to both of you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Hopkin, Council yeah, thank thanks, you for coming, uh, first thanks, of all. Thanks, Councillor Holly. Yeah, I've got a lot to say in producing this report, but I would say I'd like to thank uh, Richard Rowlands for his contribution. And uh, when we would look at, when we are looking at this report, there were some serious implications throughout this with COVID um, and, and lots of pressures throughout the authority. And overall, what I would say, it's not an outstanding report, but with all due respect, with everything that we faced during this time, I think it's, it's it's a fair reflection where we are and where we've been, and so I got nothing else to add but to hand over to um, Richard. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rowlands. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. So I should, as, as uh, Councillor Hopkins uh, just just reiterated, I should probably start off by pointing the panel to paragraph two, which is on page twenty-two of the report which uh, sets out the broader context that Councillor Hopkins was uh, referring to in terms of the impact from the pandemic and specifically its effect on performance during this whole period. In particular, paragraphs 2.7 and 2.8, which uh, notes that targets for performance were not set during 2021-2022 because of the uncertainty caused by the pandemic, whereas performance is compared to the previous year, so to 2020, 2021. Um, but that, that too serves to illustrate the effects that the, the pandemic was having on performance during that last financial year. If I can draw the panel's attention to the, to the data tables, which start on page 44 of the report and to the, uh, the graph on that page, um, also the page number on the bottom left, if that's easier to see, which is page number one. And uh, you can see the, what the graph illustrates is that um, half of the comparable indicators uh, either improved or stayed the same compared to 2020-2021. So turning firstly to uh, the information under the safeguarding priority uh, and the graph on page 47 or, or page 4 on the bottom left hand side. And we can see within this particular priority that we have 18 new uh, safeguarding indicators which is uh, the result of a new um, national social services performance framework, uh, which has been introduced by the Welsh Government. So they made up the majority of the indicators uh, within this priority, within safeguarding for 2021-2022. And because they're new, there's obviously no comparable data for these indicators uh, that we could report uh, at this stage. But if we turn back to the director's overview, which you can see on pages 45 or number two in the bottom left of the report, and it's on 46 as well, that uh, describes um, how the pandemic had a, had a big impact on people with care and support needs and on health and social care services as a whole, particularly as well the workforce which was especially acute in uh, domiciliary care services. Also, there were other issues at the time. There were problems being experienced with uh, WCCIS, which is the business information management system, which was newly rolled out during that period. So that added some complication during this time. But uh, despite the challenges, the view is that performance during this period held up well, considering the, the circumstances. 
Um, what the overview does as well, it outlines some of the challenges that were faced by both uh, children's and uh, adult services. And uh, the overall conclusion is that it would take some time for the system to recover and for performance to return to what we would have expected to have seen prior to COVID. I'll pause at that uh, point, Chef, to see if there are any comments or any questions. Any comments or questions from anyone? I think the comment that it'll take many months to recover the system as we move forward, managing the pandemic, living with the academic. I think that's an understatement. To be perfectly honest, now, I think it's a major understatement. Uh, when we look at what's happening with delayed, um, delayed uh, removal from hospitals for care, it's got to the stage where you know when you when you consider them a major problem in one of, in our hospitals and the way in which this system is working has to be questions asked about where we're going to go with this. OK. Councillor Jeff Jones. Yes, thanks Richard. Sorry, just to step back with these. You said there's new performance indicators. These indicators are actually issued by the Welsh government. Um, yes. I, from memory, you know, from some of the information you've supplied in the past, some of the are, are these all national indicators or are there some of them that actually have been set by ourselves? Yeah, so so these ones are all national indicators. They're all indicators that feature within the uh, National Social Services uh, performance framework. Um, but what I can tell the panel is that um, there has been a review of all of the corporate performance indicators uh, this year. And uh, one of the things that um, CMT were, were keen to do was to make sure that there was an appropriate balance of indicators within the suite. And as you can see, there were a lot of um, social services indicators within this particular report. So going forward from quarter two, um, there'll be a smaller number of indicators within this particular part of the report. Smaller so that you know we have a, a more targeted set of beneficial information rather than the larger, broader suite of indicators that we had at the end of year in 2020-2021. Thank you, Richard. Carry on. OK, so the next uh, next section is uh, re relation to to education and skills. And, and uh, first of all, we have the graph, which is on page 61 or, or page 18 on the bottom left hand side of the paper. And uh, that shows that we had five out of the eight indicators improving or staying the same. Again, if we go back to the director's overview on page uh, 59 or, or page 16, um, that sets out that there was continued disruption to schools from COVID. Uh, during this uh, period in 2021-2022, especially in terms of the key stage four exams where the grades were determined and where teacher assessments uh, for results for the other key stages were, were cancelled by, by Welsh Government. Um, attendance was also affected with most schools 5% uh, below the normal attendance rates, although the attendance data uh, was not being collected by Welsh Government in that financial year and will not be collected in 2022 either. On the other hand, uh, progress was made in relation to Swansea's um, ALN strategic priorities and uh, the Council uh, worked on strategies to reduce the increased number of exclusions which resulted from the impact in terms of the, the effect on pupil behaviour and also the, the overall work on the mental health and the well-being of children uh, and staff in the schools uh, was a key priority and will be a key priority going forward as well as other needs such as additional learning needs and uh, the impact of uh, poverty as well particularly in relation to the cost of living crisis if we look at the data within the report um, this shows that um, in addition to a rise in the numbers of fixed term exclusions in schools which you can see in page 63 or page 20 in the bottom left hand side. There was also a 6% rise in NEETS and in the council there have been fewer apprenticeship opportunities compared to 2020-21 which can be seen on page 62 or page 19. And you can see there as well again COVID was a major factor uh, in these respects. On the plus side uh, on page 64, page 21 on the bottom left hand side, we can see a, a much improved performance issuing statements of special educational needs. And on page 65 or page 22, uh, we saw a continuing increase in the number of training and employment weeks uh, for the unemployed or un uh, economically inactive, which is delivered through 
beyond bricks and mortar, and that was up by 23% on 2020. 2021. Again, Chair, I'll pause for any comments or any questions. Anybody comments or questions? I think the the the, uh, the, the comment about NATS is very important and one that we keep uh, an eye on because I, I think the indication of what we're doing within the whole scope of engineer of, of uh, education. Okay, Richard. Thank you. Can you carry on? So the uh, the next uh, section is regarding the economy and infrastructure. And uh, first of all, again, the, the graph on page 70 or page 27, which showed that seven out of the eight indicators within this particular section showed a decline compared to 2021, 2020, 2021. Uh, and there are comments within the report uh, for each indicator to, to explain this. Sometimes it's to do with a decline in performance because of the pandemic. Uh, so you can see that on EP28 on page 74 or page 31, uh, but there are other reasons which are set out in the report. Um, the overview, um, which is provided on page 66 or page 23, that gives a, a much more complete and comprehensive description of performance and what was done during this period to support economic recovery, improve housing, meet the decarbonisation targets and encourage tourism. Again, I'll pause here, Chair. Any questions or comments? Councillor Jeff Jones? Yeah, yes, uh, thanks Richard. <clears throat> you know, part of these, shall we say, improvements, you know, we've gone through the, if I can say, you know, the building stage and so on. It actually says about, um, you know, creating, shall we say, floor space and uh, the end result really, you know, the number of jobs. Have we got a measurement actually in place with regards to achieving that? Um, I, not that I'm aware of, uh, councillor, but I'd have to I'd have to go back and check that for you. Okay, I think you'll find that it, there there isn't actually a, 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 an actual target figure. Um, so I, I, there, there is things in our consultation exercise and in the the project um, uh, the project notes, but I don't think there is anything other than that. I, I think it's important that they should be, you know what I mean? Because you're actually creating something to actually create something else, unless the second create is actually achieved. You know, what's the point of the first? So. Except that, but I don't think this is the place that you're going to see it in this. Anyway, I think this is more to do with how the performance of the actual projects are doing. Um, and the, the results of some of the uh, activities like percentage of planning applications and that type of thing. I don't think it necessarily says because if you if you go to page 29, for instance, um, the percentage of all major applications, economic imperative were approved. That that would give you an idea of what's happening. But as you can as as Richard has said at the moment, the the, the figures are to put it bluntly a bit skewed because of COVID, and we'd have to wait and see what. The following year brings out uh, the, the reason I've actually bought. If I could refer to page seventy-two and it's twenty-nine, it's actually a, it says amount of commercial floor space measured by square meters created within the TRI targeted regeneration investment program, largest areas to accommodate job creation. Um, now you're actually creating the area, but are you creating the jobs? That's what I'm trying to get at here. I'm not sure whether your performance data would indicate that, Richard. I'm not sure. No, not not specifically in relation to these schemes. Uh, it may be that that information is captured part of this project, but or it may be you know something separate. Um, but it's not it's not captured within this report here. Any other comments? No. If not, Richard can carry on. Okay, so the uh, the next section is around tackling poverty, and we have a graph from page seventy eight or page thirty five which shows that five out of the 13 indicators improved or stayed the same compared to 2020-21. Um, the overview back on pages 75 or page 32 describes again the uh, the particular impact from COVID and, and also the cost of living crisis on people's standard of living. And we can see that impact from the pandemic in terms of the increased processing times for council tax and housing benefits on page 79 
or page 36 and page 80 or page 37. Also, the number of additional housing units delivered by the council, which you can see on page 81 uh, or page 38, improved compared to 2020, 2021, but numbers from other sources, such as section 106 agreements, declined. Although some of those figures are to be verified um, and there is a natural variation in terms of the number of housing units completed from year to year. We can see the impact from COVID again on pages 83, which is or page 40, and page 84, which is page 41, where we have a reduced number of welfare appeals and tribunals, again, as a result of COVID lowering the amount of welfare benefits that could be secured by the welfare rights unit, and also where the average number of days homeless families with children spend in bed and breakfast um, increased again because the pandemic was, was putting pressure on uh, temporary accommodation at the time. Uh, on the positive side, on pages 84 or page 41 and page 85 or page 42, we can see an increase in the numbers of people gaining employment through employability support and accredited qualifications with the local authority support, which is up by 6% and 38% respectively. And again, I'll pause here, Chair. Any questions or comments? No. Thank you, Richard. Could you carry on? OK, so the Pentelbonet section, Transformation of Future Council, we have the graph on page 89 or page 46, which shows three out of the five indicators improving compared to 2020-21. The overview then on page 86 or page 43, that describes the overall progress that's been made, but there are only two indicators within the report showing a drop in performance, and one is staff sickness on page 90 or page 47. Again, mainly the result of uh, COVID. And the other is a drop in the number of forms completed online, which is on page 91 or page 48, which dropped because of a fall in requests for services such as recycling bag requests and bulk waste, again, as a result of, uh, of lockdown. On the plus side, the number of payments through the council's websites, which you can see on page 90 or page 47, that did increase, that increased by 17% when compared to 2020-2021. And I'll pause again, Chair. All right, thank you, Richard. Any questions or comments? I, I would like to say, if I can, Richard, a bit about this sickness. It's been quite well advertised and what have you. I don't think people realise the nature of some of the occupations that are, are within the City Council. Uh, there are a number of jobs which, to put it bluntly, um, lend itself to you catching sickness to some extent. I mean, refuge collectors are out in all weathers. Uh, we have social, uh, we have um, care assistants who go in to see people who are ill. So, uh, and people who need some form of help uh, through physical uh, physical activity. In other words, get lifting them out of bed or helping them. Uh, get up or things of that nature. So whilst yes, sickness is a problem, but we have to understand what the underlying problem is with sickness. It isn't as if people who are sitting in an office, we have a huge amount of sickness in that uh, area. Our sickness is more was a physical activity as well. So I think it's important and I will be talking to you in future about if we can in some shape or form define what we mean by sickness in uh, our performance. I think it actually doesn't do the council credit the way in which sickness is portrayed in the press. Uh, and I think we need to think about that in the future. Thank you, Richard. Can you continue? Oh, sorry. Leader? Yeah, Chair, may I come in on that point? I'm, I'm very, very grateful for your comments that I'm sure the staff will be too, because I, I was quite alarmed uh, to read the reports from the Audit and Governance Committee by some of the lay members there, um, which appeared to be quite disrespectful, I think, to our staff, um, because, you know, when the figures were looked at at that committee, uh, clearly a, a large number of the days were related to COVID absence. And, you know, when you break that down into areas like social care, 
where it would have been wrong for people who were infected for, with COVID to go into a position where they were with a vulnerable person who they may pass that infection onto. It's absolutely right. And it's absolutely the right thing to do in terms of safety as well for the vulnerable person, that that person uh, remains outside of the workplace. So um, I am grateful for your comments there, Shen. I, I do agree. I, I, something Councillor Hopkins and I have discussed is around a greater breakdown of the, the sickness numbers with some uh, more granularity in there, because I am really proud of the way our staff responded during the COVID pandemic. I'm, I'm really proud of what they did. And some of the sickness absence that's recorded is enforced sickness absence because of the rules around that. So I, I just don't think that should be lost when we look at these numbers, as you say, which could easily be misrepresented. Yeah, if I could just reiterate everything the leader said, you know, we take this very seriously, but we also give as much support as we possibly can because during this time, we did prioritise things like social care and particularly domiciliary care staff during during the, this period to try and ensure they would all the staff to try to keep them in work. But as you said, the nature of the job itself, you know, will encourage sickness in some respects because you can't take COVID in somebody else's house. So what I would say, I do really appreciate your comments and um, and I think it, you're right, we probably would welcome a breakdown of these, but we do take sickness seriously in this in this authority. And I can assure you, we work very closely with the trade unions to, to tackle a, a sickness, but as, as the leader said, I think sickness during this time in some respects was forced uh, on certain individuals. And you're right, the nature of the job is spot on, uh, Chair, I think you are right. It, it, will, it will, ha will not encourage sickness, but the nature of the job will make sickness, there's no doubt. Correct. Uh, thank you, Richard. But I, I think uh, uh, at some stage in the future, a discussion needs to be had about how we actually measure it. And uh, I understand that the audit committee and the, the, the questions raised, but we as a scrutiny board understand better the role of what our staff are and what the role of staff are doing. But we need the ones are the ones that would need to understand how if we can break that down further. Thank you. Can 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 can, can you continue? Hold on a minute. Let me take. Uh, can you please continue? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So we're on the the uh, the final priority now, which is regarding nature and biodiversity. So we have the graph on page ninety five or page fifty two, which shows three out of the four indicators improving compared to 2020, 2021. We have the recycling indicator on page 97 or page 54, which shows some provisional data indicating a slight drop in performance compared to 2020-21. And again, this is largely due to the impact of COVID where more black bags are being generated. On the positive side, uh, the report is showing uh, carbon reduction across all council buildings and more trees being planted during the year as well. In fact, 121% increase on 2020-2021. And the overview back on page 93 or page 50 provides a much more comprehensive overview of performance for this priority during the year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Richard. Any questions or comments? No? Okay. Can I thank you, Richard, for your report? Uh, and it was a di I know it was a difficult time period and uh, hopefully the next one won't be so bad. But thank you very much for your report. Thank you, Chair.